Hello, it's time to do the third lecture now. So I hope we got audio working and everything. Please let me know in the chat when you see that everything is, is okay. So, uh, and then we're gonna start off with this next lecture. Hi everyone. <laughs> We got some audio. Everything is working yet. And then we're gonna start. Yeah, it seems to be working. Perfect. All right then. Let's do this. And uh, this lecture, I want to start it off by. Uh, I want to show you some images here. And uh, and I want you to just concentrate look at these images think about how how it's uh, how it makes you feel yeah it's working good morning uh, christoph and good morning eric nice to meet you in the chat <laughs> great so now we're going to take a look at uh, these pictures it's going to be a, a picture series i'm i don't think i'm going to say anything i'm just going to show these pictures and you i think you will get a, a, a certain feeling inside you when you look at them so we switch over to full screen like this and uh, here we go So what do you feel when you see these pictures? I mean, uh, I know what I feel here. It's uh, quite obvious that I get a very pleasant feeling when I'm looking at the the earlier part of this little slideshow. But then something happens in the middle when we switch to more indoor, built environment, urban environment. And that is, uh, oh yeah, good morning. Good morning, Isaac. Nice to meet you. And uh, this uh, this feeling that we get from from nature. I mean, e this is silent. We don't we don't even have any sound here. But just by looking at these pictures, it's like it's like uh, our mind places us in a certain state, and we 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 can almost hear what these pictures would would sound like. But then, then something happens when we go indoors, because it's uh, it's kind of strange. We we we're kind of designed to have perfect hearing when we are outdoors, but yet we sp we spend like more than ninety percent of our time inside a building, <laughs> and that's uh, why it's become a bit of a it's not optimum. Because uh, it's such a such a long time through history when we've been we've been walking outdoors and uh, yeah it's uh, it's where we're supposed to be. I I want to show you here a little video that I recorded earlier this year when I wa I was out on a walk and it was I I I was just struck by all oh, that wow. This this is like the best acoustics I've ever heard. So I, I grabbed my phone and I recorded a short wi video. So at th we're going to take a look at it 
let's see here. We'll go full screen. Here's me out in the forest. We check the video then. Okay. I want to show you a very good sound environment. This is about as good as it gets. I'm in the middle of the forest. The weather is fantastic. And there's also a lot of snow on the ground. It's been dumping for a couple of days. So it's like a porous layer of sound absorbing material everywhere. And here in the forest, you have all the trees, which gives a rather diffuse reflection of sound waves. So yeah, it's, it's just such a comfortable place to be. And the speech clarity is about as good as it can get, humanly possible. And let's just check the background sound level here. You know, it's still 24, 25 dB, eh? But the reason is there's snow falling. Stripping down snow from the branches of the trees. It's like a high frequency, very, very pleasant sound. Maybe, I don't know if the camera can catch it, but it's going on all around here. I think it might be that the, the sun, the sun is warming the treetops, which makes the, the snow melt and it starts to fall down. But I would say that the background sound level here is about 20, 20 dBA. I did a check a couple of minutes before when it was dead silent. And that, that's, I think, even though this is a really nice Norsonic 150 sound level meter, it's about as quiet as I can measure because the, the equipment has, it gets hard to measure really, really quiet levels. Now I can hear an airplane somewhere in the background. Well, the thing is, when you're in an environment like this, which is absolutely quiet, you can hear everything. You can hear traffic, even though it's far away. It's, it's such a nice place to be, this. I think when we approach summer, I should really take my measurement equipment out here to the forest and do some impulse response measurements and, and see what kind of objective numbers can we get out of this fantastic acoustic environment here in the trees? Because this is, this is something I realized the other day. I, I have this dream that I'm working with, with Ackerwood. And I live in this environment. I see the forest. I can hear this nature sounds every day. This, this is like the reference level. I just want to capture some of, some of this amazing sound qualities, this perception, this environment. What if we could package a little of this, this beautiful environment and design our buildings so they can reflect this? That would be something. That would be really, really cool. And I think that's... That's why I've been so attracted to wooden buildings. Because with wooden buildings, you can actually do this. You can recreate nature inside a building. And that's basically what a building acoustician's job is. It's precisely what we're supposed to do. We should design our buildings so that they remind us of nature. Because this is where we belong. This is where our history is outdoors in the wilderness. And in, then in the, this last couple of hundred years, we decided that we're going to live inside rectangular rooms, which you don't find anywhere in nature. But we could compensate somewhat for this if, if we can design the buildings so that they resemble nature. And our job with Ackerwood, in that case, that would be to design our buildings so that the acoustical properties resemble this. That's, that's a really good idea. 
now it's time to get back to the office and do just that. Have a very nice, nice weekend. Yeah, it's the end of the week now. See you later. Yeah, that was a, a really, really nice day. And I got so I got I got completely carried away by how amazing acoustics we had that day, and and it's like I said in the video, it's uh, that that's like the reference level, that 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 sound environment. It's it's so nice, and if we can design our buildings so that they re remind us of of nature, that 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 that's what I believe we we can create the like the perfect building. And it's no wonder, because if you, you consider evolution and you consider our human history, it's about two million years ago we, we started to walk upright. And th this is an uh, immense long time. It's insane how, how much time this is. And a couple of hundred years in the end of this process, it changes nothing. I mean, our, our bodies, our, our biology is, is, is still the same. We're, we're basically still cavemen, <laughs> our, our programs and systems that are running inside us. Just as an example here, like toilet paper was patented in 1883. So we, we've only been wiping our asses for a little over 100 years. <laughs> and still, still with this virus pandemic, then it was like crazy. Oh, we can't live without toilet paper. Yeah, but it was, uh, it's been it worked quite nicely for a really long time before that. So, so I mean, that, that's just an example of how, how important it is to remember where we come from and, uh, and try to adapt our environment to reflect that. We, we have these five senses. We've got smell, we've got vision, we've got taste and we've got touch and hearing. Well, the thing with this is that our ears, they work 24-7. They never rest. Even when we are sleeping, they're still doing their job. And it's a matter of safety and security. If we are exposed to danger while we are sleeping, our ears make sure that we wake up and so that we can protect ourselves or run away and th this is also the reason that why it's important to make sure that our bedrooms and our dwellings that they are quiet so that we don't provoke this safety mechanism uh, and uh, wake wake up and we believe it's a threat wh when it's actually the neighbor is closing his door or it's the elevator that goes up and down or maybe it's just a bus that is passing on the street but it's going to start up this this whole uh, program with the danger in our brains. And we don't want that. I mean, uh, another example with this, uh, with this nature, nature environment, which I showed you out there in the forest, we have, I mean, th there's no parallel walls. There are no flat surfaces. It's, it's open. And, Another important thing is that you have you have the sky above. So we're not used to getting sound reflections that are coming from above because usually it's just sky and and the only source of sound there is <laughs> like the birds that we can hear from above. And that's the reason why we if if you look inside a public building you often have a sound absorbing ceiling. And by putting a sound absorbing ceiling in s inside the room to your ears, this will look like the blue sky. So we simulate the blue sky by putting sound absorbing material in the ceiling. And then on the walls, if they are pla flat, it's not going to sound that pleasant. But if we have walls that can reflect sound back towards us in a more diffuse way, so that it, yeah, I would say, consider this, if you take the f uh, uh, strong flashlight and you point it in a mirror then you're going to get a huge reflection back because all these light rays come back at you all at once that is the same thing as if you have a flat wall if you take that, si that same flashlight and you point it at a disco ball 
you know what happens. It just it goes in all directions. And this is what happens when, when the sound waves hit the trees around me and the branches. And even th there's irregularities all around. It's basically like an acoustic disco ball all around me. And then that's why the, the different reflections, they don't come all at once. So we don't get this uh, really strong light effect with our ears. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what we want to do, resemble nature when we design it. We move on. Now I'm going to talk a little about noise and health issues. Here, here's a, an image where we have, <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot. We managed to capture a lot of noise sources in just one, <laughs> in just one photograph. We have the big, the big autobahn highway and the the airline is in the background. You can even see a couple of wind power plants over there. So, so the here's here's a it's a noisy place for sure. Now, if you're exposed to to noise. It, here are some of the things that uh, will happen to you. Yeah, hearing loss, strong noise is gonna destroy your hearing organ, basically. You can get sleep disturbance, which I mentioned earlier. If you, I think it's about 45 dBA, when the level goes above that, it's like a trigger that wakes you up, so, so you can take cautionary measures. But you can also have conversation difficulties and thi this is uh, I mean Im important important communication can can get lost w if if uh, if you're in an uh, environment where it's really noisy and you you can't really hear and and then you start to lift your hearing protector and ah, what are you saying and then there's this huge bang right then and that that's uh, what i mentioned in a previous lecture like if you're in a radioactive environment and you open your hazard suit just for a little moment but you're still going to get exposed to to a lot of radiation you ha you have a certain amount of energy that you can expose yourself to and uh, if you're in a high noise environment you fill that ratio up really really fast and th this one also relates to conversation difficulty you you get concentration loss you if you're going to write an important report or something, a t thesis, and you're sitting in an open plan uh, office where people are talking all around you. It's like you, you, you cannot not listen to that conversation. And I think even worse would be if you're listening to someone talking on the phone because then you get like half of the conversation and then your, your brain starts to fill in the gaps and that that would be probably even more annoying than if you would listen to a full conversation. But understanding speech and reading, I mean, this can also be really catastrophic if you consider, if, if you're gonna, hey, watch out, beware of that truck that is approaching. What? And then just splat, someone gets hit by a truck. You, you can't warn people if they can't hear you and if you can't communicate in a proper way. And then... If you consider, like in the uh, juridical system, if there's a trial with a uh, accused criminal, and if if the speech isn't properly transmitted from source to receiver, and they they might they don't hear what the testimony is, and then they can base a verdict on a, something that is not correct, which is because of acoustics. And uh, yeah, that that's also an interesting. No, because if you're going to design uh, a building where they have like trials w with the judges and attorneys and all, all that, that's uh, like one of the most challenging things you can do as an acoustician because you have all, all, all this with noise and, and uh, speech quality and it's uh, sound insulation, secrecy, it's, it's all at once. So that's a really something, uh, a, a huge one too work with memory logical thinking yours you are students and uh, if if you're gonna get uh, a proper return from your from your education you need to have uh, a proper sound environment so that you can optimize your your uh, memory and log log logical thinking and th this is like a way that I think it's 
it's probably quite a wise investment to invest those extra dollars when you design a school so that you increase the all these processes by just a few percentage but it's going to result in more learning and the people and the, the students when they come out into society they will have they will take they will have more education with them when they leave because of the acoustics can we put a value on that how much money would that be worth for society if you extrapolate it for a, a couple of decades I just wish I could uh, I could point on this. This is how much money we could save by introducing proper acoustics, and I suspect it would be a no-brainer. But it's it's quite a challenge to to actually prove it. That is, uh, that the acoustical measures have this certain effect. My gut feeling says it's absolutely so, but it's it's uh, important to to put some numbers on it as well. Reduced learning and performance. Yeah, we touched upon that medical problems you get uh, your body is damaged also if you're exposed to a lot of noise for a long time so we have some physiological effects here that we can uh, that we know correlate to to noise like high blood pressure you can get a stress increase where the cortisol levels rise there's heart attack and brain hemorrhage even even obesity, there are links with, with noise. Diabetes. Here's this uh, report from the World Health Organization in 2018. It's called Environmental Noise Guidelines for the European Re Region. And this, in this uh, text, which you can find online if you Google it, they have a term that they call D-A-L-Y, DALY, disability adjusted life years and what what that means is basically uh, disability adjusted life year if you if you are affected by noise in such a way that you either die because of illness or you become ill so you you cannot get the full life quality then that would be counted as a as a, a lost year and there's an indication that at least one million healthy life years are lost every year because of traffic-related noise in Western Europe. Traffic noise. There are many other noise sources as well. So uh, it's quite clear to me that this has a huge social impact, which also has an economic impact. If we lose a million of healthy years, just imagine for a little second how much value we could create in, in one million healthy years. It's staggering. And what they present in this uh, text is a strong recommendation to keep the equivalent sound pressure level below 55 dB from traffic noise. And uh, here's another text from Sweden, it's from the municipalities, where they have checked at the Swedish conditions compared to this uh, DALI disability lost lost life years. And we have in Sweden we have like forty one thousand lost years every year because of noise from road and traffic on railways. It's about 1,000 heart attacks and 1,000 cases of stroke every year. And about 500 of these result in death. So it's definitely, it's definitely an important topic to consider the acoustics and sound environment. Absolutely. But it's, uh, it's like I measured probably before that when the acousticians commit mistakes, people die, but it, it takes a couple of decades it, it, it accumulates incrementally over time before it gets you. Whereas if a structural engineer makes some uh, calculation errors on, on a beam so that the building collapses, it's uh, instant feedback. Now, this is perhaps one of my all-time favorite images. 
I, I use this one as a, on the cover on my PhD thesis because I think it's absolutely perfect. It symbolizes precisely what acoustics is all about. You have the sandwich and you have the calipers. And here we can measure the sandwich and we can get an objective rating on the thickness of this sandwich to an one tenth of a millimeter precision. But what does that tell you about whether the sandwich is tasty or not? So the calibers, they symbolize objective measurement, whereas the sandwich symbolizes subjective perception. And this is, this is precisely what we're doing as acousticians when we're running around with our sound level meters. This is my calipers. I go and measure the, the thickness <laughs> of the sound. But what does that tell us about whether it's a tasty sandwich or not? Because uh, like we saw in the first lecture especially that a sound can be really pleasant to to one person and at the same time be really unpleasant to another person. So th this is what I've been doing my whole career to try to design better calipers, to de develop bet better methods on how to measure sound so that we get a better better description of the a better correlation between objective and subjective a better correlation between measurement and perception that's what it's all about now we're going to talk a little bit about sound requirements and uh, a saying that I like is that reality it's like a grayscale whereas the requirements they are in black and white because we, we, we need to have guiding documents legal documents that tell us that yeah we should build in this or that way and that means that we we have to put a number on it but there is no black and white limit in reality that if you're above this level, then everyone is complaining, and if you're below it, you're safe. It's always a gray scale, and this is something we need to deal with when we when we set a, a sound requirement. I mean, there are, for once, it, it's it's the subjective difference that uh, people perceive the dif uh, the sound as more or less annoying. But you also have things like measurement precision. I mean, there's an uncertainty. When, when I do measurements objectively with this, even as a scientist, I can never measure 100% exactly what it's like. You always have a measurement uncertainty. And that, that also, it's, it's like a span. So where do we set the bar? Should we s how high or low should we set it to get an adequate requirement that is wise? A sad thing is that acoustics only becomes an issue when they are problematic. Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree. But it's, uh, it's like we're waking up to it at least. I, I, I think we, we get people listen to us more and more now. That's at least what what I've experienced, and that that warms my heart a lot. And 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 in certain projects, it's. I absolutely love it as an acoustician where you can come into a project and you have people who they want to go they want to walk the extra mile and do more than what the than just the requirements tell you. And th yeah, that's truly a good feeling. What we have here is like an S curve where we have annoyance ratio on the Y axis and we have the impact sound level on the X axis here. And the curve is going to look like this, because if, if we have the impact sound level, it's the sound when a neighbor is walking. How much of that do you hear from the boom, boom, boom walking sound, or the running kids? It's obvious to us that the more of that booming sound from walking that you can hear, the more the annoyance ratio is going to go up. But it's never going to go down to zero you're always going to have a certain little percentage of people who are annoyed no matter what happens. There are always going to be complaints. 
And that's why it doesn't go all the way to zero, it's just close to. But you uh, you will probably find some kind of like threshold area that when, when you increase a certain decibel rating, then people start to complain. And then you get kind of a linear increase up to, I don't know, let's say 60 dB or something. Then everyone starts complaining. And that, that means that if you go from 60 to 70 to 80, on, on this curve when you start to approach this then you're gonna get a hundred percent annoyance ratio it doesn't matter if it's 70 db or if it's uh, 100 db if people start complaining at 70 that's why you get the s curve and what we are dealing with as acousticians when we uh, try to develop better requirements is it's this area of the curve so should we how much how much uh, complaints should we accept? Should we aim for 99% uh, happiness or 95 or 90% or perhaps we should accept that even 20% is com complaining here? Where do we set the bar? And th this is uh, this is also where where we have the the minimum requirements from the authorities and then you can also have if you build more like premium constructions you might uh, increase the you oh, raise the bar it's actually you, you take it down <laughs> i mean yeah you, you 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 have some more strict requirements if you build a premium dwelling compared to uh, the minimum requirements and the minimum requirements is based on a, a kind of a a reasonable compromise between uh, different uh, measures of sustainability because now we've been talking a lot about health which is primarily a social sustainability but it's also if you if you're going to build so you have zero complaints it's going to be extremely expensive but because the lower you go on that s curve the money cost increases exponentially and also the ecological footprint of a building is going to get worse and worse and worse if you if you try to make like the absurd level of sound insulation so we always have to balance these three pillars of sustainability in a good way towards and with each other it's not just about co2 reduction and, and it's it's not not only about health and it's not only about money it's all three of them because if you remove one of them, the s society will collapse. So the sound requirements in buildings is um, in in Sweden we have the BBR and we have this standard which is called two five two six seven, and the BBR that's like the minimum requirements given by the authorities that you you cannot you sh shouldn't and you cannot build. Uh, worse building than that but then you also have this uh, Swedish standard 25267 where you have sound clauses A, B and uh, D and uh, D is something that is very rarely used it's mostly for like old buildings but if, you're to if we're talking about newly erected buildings it's uh, sound clause B is quite common and that is uh, like a 4 dB stricter requirement on on uh, the sound parameters to achieve a considerably better sound environment indoors compared to the minimum requirements and this is in dwellings and then you have yeah you have in uh, in bbr there are like tables inside that text in chapter 7 where they write out what all the decibel values should be earlier you before 2015 we had sound clauses a b c and d where sound class c was the minimum level in sweden but what happened is you took sound class c and you put it inside bbr instead and that that's uh, that's why there is a letter missing on that other one and with premises you have uh, another swedish standard called 25268 and here you still have all the four sound classes there is an ongoing discussion to move sound class C into BBR for buildings as well, but we're, we're not quite there yet.
And then inside these texts, we have like five parameters that determine the acoustic environment. And the first one is airborne sound insulation. Its sound is propagated through the air, human speech. You're listening to music. It's uh, uh, your dog is bar barking and uh, yeah, stuff like that. Th those kind of sounds that are produced in a building. Uh, or it could also be uh, related to uh, the kind of activity that goes on inside uh, a room. If if there's a uh, what should we call it? An office, perhaps. You you have uh, meeting rooms where you uh, want to achieve some some secrecy, perhaps that you can have a meeting inside that room without people listening in on it. And then we have the next one is impact sound insulation, which is uh, primarily walking sound from other rooms, but it's also sound that can be from uh, when you know when you take the chairs and you like eh, eh, when you pu pull it back and forth on a on a on a floor you can get uh, quite a lot of sound or it can be that you dr drop things on the floor like structural uh, noises of certain kinds so that that's the impact sound insulation we've got uh, noise from installations and that's the kind of installations that you you need into in the building like ventilation, you need refrigerators, and you need radiators to keep warm, and those kind of sounds that you you cannot turn them off. Whereas when you start the kitchen fan when you're uh, cooking, that that's not an counted like as an installation noise because it's your choice to turn it on and off. We've got noise from external sources, like traffic, could be railway traffic or air uh, airplanes, cars. Could also be if you have uh, these uh, things. I don't know the English word loftgång in Swedish, where 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 you have the apartments on the building like this, and you have uh, this uh, long balcony where you go into each building. Then you have you might have uh, talking sound that you need need to have a, a proper sound insulation on the outer wall towards even those kinds of sounds. Or you can have when you come into a building, there's like this. Beep, 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 you know, the, the telephone and you call the one, hey, can you lo uh, let me in? And if, if you have a bedroom adjacent to that one, you, m you might get complaints because there's a lot of talking noise going on. So that's also a, a one form of external source. And then we have reverberation time, which is a measure of how, how long a sound stays inside a room. Like when I clap my hands like, <coughs> like this. It's uh, it takes it. I create a sound pressure, and then it takes a little while before it dies out. And th this uh, you you don't really have requirements in in dwellings because um, people they need to put in whatever furniture they want inside a dwelling. But you have some requirements in the in the stairwells, for instance, or corridors. And if we're talking in premises like uh, offices, schools, cafeterias dining rooms, meeting rooms, rooms for communication, then you have more stricter requirements on, uh, on the room acoustics in the room, which uh, deals with reverberation time. So let's start here with uh, sound insulation. I like this picture because it symbolizes uh, sound insulation in a good way. You have this beautiful house on in the mountains and it's uh, snow when it's winter outdoors. And when you're inside this house, you want to keep warm. So if you have proper heat insulation here, the construction contains the heat inside the house. And it's the same thing with sound insulation. We want to make sure that the sound stays in the same room where it is produced. Then we're going to have good sound insulation. So this I mean, th th this is uh, a common misunderstanding that I, I come across constantly. <laughs> this is not about putting some uh, soft material like cloth on the walls or sound absorbing material in the ceiling or m egg uh, curtains. You put them on the walls like in their music rehearsal rooms. That is not sound insulation. Sound insulation is structural engineering. It's the construction of the house. It deals with uh, 
the plates and the beams and the, that kind of stuff. That's what sound insulation is all about. We have to build something that is airtight, that does not vibrate and transmit sound to other rooms. Then we will have good sound insulation. And just like with the heating insulation, if you if there's minus 20 degrees centigrade outdoors, if you open a window, it's going to become cold indoors because the heat goes out. And it's the same thing with, with sound. If, if, you, if you open a window, you're going to get a lot more of the traffic noise inside the room. And the purpose of sound insulation, it's actually two things with the uh, with, uh, sound insulation that we need to consider. And the first and probably most obvious one is to avoid annoyance. We don't want to get people disturbed by, by sound. And by, by constructing a building so that we get proper sound insulation, we won't create annoyance. And annoyance can come in, in many forms. It could be that uh, you have a, a meeting room where you're talking important stuff with your colleagues. And then there's people walking in, in the corridor outdoors. And the, the, the door isn't, has bad sound insulation and the wall is bad sound insulation. So you're going to hear what they're talking about outside the room. And, and that's going to annoy you. And it's like in a dwelling. If you have a neighbors that are having a party or if they're talking and with a li loud voice, you also get annoyance. But there's a second component as well here, which is secrecy. We also want to build in such a way that sound stays inside the room because it's not supposed to leave the room. If you consider a CEO office or maybe something in healthcare where they have like psychology or they, they, uh, they have very personal talks and maybe they start crying and, 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 and stuff like that. You don't want those conversations to leave the room. Or in the, in the with the police and juridical system with the, uh, th those kind of conversations, they need to stay secret. So sometimes it's the annoyance aspect that is the one that we need to focus on. Sometimes it's the secrecy. Because if, if it's just, if we only want to achieve secrecy, then it could be okay if we have a meeting room and they are they are having a conversation in there and if you are in the other room you can hear that people are talking inside this meeting room but it sounds like this you can hear that someone is talking but you cannot distinguish what they are saying that's the key here the information in the speech needs to stay inside the room and then, of course, if they raise their voice and they talk really, really loudly, then maybe you lose secrecy. But if you talk with a normal voice, you're going to achieve secrecy. So a meeting conference room, for instance, in an office, is often designed in such a way that you, you cannot hear the information, but you can hear that they are talking. Whereas in a, a dwelling, your, your homes, then we need to be able to talk with a loud voice and still achieve secrecy. But however, if you talk like I just did, your neighbors will probably hear you and then you can get the annoyance, but at least you have, you have the secrecy. So these two, when we design a requirement, we have to balance them with each other. And now, like I, I measured before, uh, m mentioned before about this uh, common misconception that I uh, often come across, it deals with uh, damping and insulation. Like if you if you put the sound absorbing panels, you achieve damping. It is in the same room as the source. You got sound energy in the room, which is transformed into heat energy in sound absorbers by friction. When the sound wave makes these small absorbing materials move back and forth, they will convert the sound energy into heat. But it's, it's not what you want if you want to have good sound insulation. But I mean, uh, it's like if I do like this, you can still hear me very good on the other side of the fabric when I, when I have that jacket in front of my mouth. <laughs> so so this, thi this would be damping.
but it's not sound insulation because sound insulation that is something that is between different rooms it's the it's su supposed to stop propagation of sound and make sure the sound stays inside the same room so of course if i put a sound absorbing ceiling i hang some heavy cloths and curtains around me you you will have a more damped sound environment but the sound can still leave the room and and go to another room so don't mix these two up it's very important now I'm gonna move on and talk a little bit about uh, my passion with the uh, wood wooden buildings and here we have a, a little wooden building I think it's a beautiful picture here you have a bunch of Swedish cities the names of Swedish cities and a bunch of years and in the background you have the flames which consume these cities because when they they built in wood back in history but they got sick and tired of the whole cities burning down all the time so uh, there was actually a prohibition to build in uh, multi-story buildings in wood for quite a long time but then in 1994 wooden buildings were allowed again to be built in more than two stories and it was like yeah let's do it and then we had methods to measure and quantify sound insulation and then of course we we use those methods for our wooden buildings but what happened really quickly here when they did this is that the perceived sound insulation varies between different construction systems even with equal measured sound insulation so in this example you have a, a, a concrete house and a wooden house and they have the same value for airborne sound insulation 52 dB in both cases and you have the same value of the impact sound insulation 56 dB in both cases but the complaints were more common in the wooden structure and here we measured from 100 Hertz and up now if you only build in heavy con concrete constructions which is uh, typically the norm internationally too you don't have much problem below 100 Hertz it's like a non question but when you start to build in wood you you might notice some differences that even if you have the same weighted number 52 that means that uh, the frequency content of the sound can can be quite different I mean if I'm talking into the sound me level meter and I have like 60 dB and then I go ask my wife and she talks in into the sound meter and it's also 60 dB but it sounds completely different because we are producing different frequency content and that's something that was the cause of this because here's a picture that illustrates the typical problem it was like you you had an elephant upstairs and also there were some problems with the uh, music when we were listening to like <laughs> which was um, effectively transmitted in the wooden structure so here things moved quite fast so already in 1999 new requirements were introduced which included measurements from 50 Hertz we go further down in the frequency spectrum to make sure we capture those booming sound from the running children or the subwoofer in the music and the home cinema equipments and, and all that stuff and then there was a major improvement so and that that's still what we're using today we measure from 50 hertz but we're we're not quite there yet there's still some work to be done here because uh, the perceived sound insulation sound insulation varies between different construction systems even with equally measured sound insulation but it's not the angry smiley anymore it's just like it's he's he's not as happy <laughs> as as the other one and we d we can't have it that way one one way to deal with this is that we we uh, take some uh, extra measures we aim a little bit above the target when we build in wood and then it's all fine and this is uh, typically something that has been adopted in the in the industry today but we uh, we really want to find a way to uh, quantify sound insulation so that 
the sound insulation is neutral to the construction system. What we've found in the research is that it's now we were it's primarily the impact sound insulation here which needs a little bit more attention because it seems like airborne sound insulation there is no point to go further than 50 hertz and some argue that maybe we don't even have to go to to 50 hertz because it could be uh, it could be uh, interesting to consider our culture and the way we produce audio also changes over time because Back in the early 2000s and uh, late 90s, maybe these subwoofer and music and uh, movies, home cinema. What if they were more common back then? And what if today maybe we're consuming a bit more with these headphones? And we listen more to podcasts and conversations instead of listening to, to a heavy bass. And that is also something that needs to be considered. That... How, how do we live our life? What kind of sound do we produce? So uh, it's it's uh, it's always a constant battle between what what is an adequate sound requirement and where where how high or low should we aim? So we got a question here: Isn't measuring in situ as uh, that is like field measurements in a real building below 100 hertz not very difficult with uh, equipment, standing waves? Yeah, yeah, it's it's correct. If you if you want to measure sound from 100 hertz or above for high frequencies basically it's uh, it's easier let's put it that way because when you move around in inside the room with your with your sonometer like this and you you measure the sound pressure level in in a room then you're going to have now now it's uh, a bit of a it's a, it's a s quite there's not much noise inside here, but uh, if, let's consider if there were some noise inside this room, I, I could I could point my sound level meter. I measure here, I get the same result. I measure up here, I get the same result. No matter where I put the microphone, I would still get basically the same measurement result. But when we increase the frequency spectrum and we go and measure the lower frequencies, that's when when it becomes more challenging because then you can have a huge difference in sound pressure level like if you measure up here and you put the sound level meter a bit lower to the floor or whatever i think i've seen more than 30 db difference between just one or what i can reach with my arm just like going like so and i could see a, a difference in, in in 30 db on on a steady state sound something that is like <laughs> constantly constantly inside the room so definitely there's there's more challenges to to take into account when we when we go into the low frequency domain but we we can handle it we need to pr for like in we have to measure more more uh, points inside the room we have to measure perhaps for a longer period of time and yeah th there are measurement standards to to deal with a 50 to 100 hertz range but uh, measurement uncertainty is yeah it's definitely definitely an issue that needs to be considered now here's the a little further reason we, we have two uh, curves here of uh, walking sound it's a sound pressure level in the living room when the neighbor is walking uh, above or it's actually when i'm i'm using a uh, a tapping machine. Yeah, I can show you it. It, it looks like it looks like this. Th this is an uh, a, a, a tapping machine that we use with with the hammers, and uh, and then you can uh, you put this one on. Uh, where's the switch here? As you see, there's sm these small hammers that fall up and down, and they bang on the floor and produce sound, and then we. Uh, we go in, into the room below or um, uh, horizontally the next room and measure how much how much sound pressure level is produced in the next room and uh, it should be of course then as as low as possible low lower is better <coughs> but then when we when we take a look here at at the wooden and the concrete room they they have the same measured uh, single number quantity of of uh, 
the weighted sound insulation. It's the same rating here. Both are class B Swedish living rooms. But the content, the frequency content is, is very different in, in both these cases. You can see the concrete has uh, worse performance at, at the higher frequencies. Like if, you walk, if you're walking with shoes, it's going to be clappity, 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 clap, and you've got to get more of that kind of sound in the neighbor's room if you're on a concrete floor. Where th and that, that's, uh, in that case, the wooden floor would have an edge because the wood is more soft material than concrete is a bit more damp, so you get less of the clappity clap from the shoes. But then when you look at the lower end of the frequency spectrum, you can see then the, 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 the roles have shifted. So then you have a higher sound pressure level at the lower frequencies and, uh, and a quieter level on the concrete. So that means that uh, there's uh, more booming sound in, in the, on the wooden uh, floor compared to the concrete floor. Now, if we evaluate impact sound insulation in limited frequency range, the research that we've been working with here in, in Sweden for the last decade or even more, we have indications that we might, we may need to extend the frequency range and look even further down, down to 20 hertz, because then the stars, they're really going to different directions. The the wooden sound pressure level goes up and the concrete goes down. Now, now if we, if we look at these if these two graphs, it's it's quite obvious why why we usually used to measure from 100 hertz and up. It didn't really matter that much what goes on in the lower frequencies because the sound pressure level goes down for the concrete. But when we introduce lightweight buildings like wood, and we're probably going to see a lot more of them globally too because of the climate issue to get down the CO2 emissions. So I think more and more countries are waking up to this. And there are several countries now who have included the 50 hertz standard into, into their building code. It's coming. And when you start, when you start to build in wood, you will be, become aware of this challenge. And like we said before about these measurement uncertainty problems, yeah, of course, it's, uh, if we go even further down, we're going to complicate things uh, a bit more also with a uh, measurement so we're not we're not really there yet with this one but there is really exciting research going on which is going to be published now in the near future to uh, try to finally figure this out what what was be would be the perfect <laughs> sound measurement because this is what we want we want to find a single number quantity like this we call LNTW20 for instance and if we have the same number we should have the same smiley face as well people should be equally happy or equally annoyed if we have the same rating so i'm think i'm about halfway, so this could perhaps be a good place in the lecture to take a little five minute break. So I, uh, I'll start my timer now and I'll be back in precisely five minutes. See you soon.
All right, five minutes has passed, so let's move on here. I'll uh, think I'll do like so, like the previous lectures also. That I'd, now I'm just gonna keep moving. I, I, may, maybe I'll finish in time until twelve o'clock, or if I don't, I'm just gonna keep going, and you can uh, come back and look at it, uh, finish it later if you have to get going. But uh, I think that'll be fine. So let's see. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about measurement of sound insulation and how, how we deal with this. So in this picture, this is what goes on inside a room, because previous le lecture we talked about uh, how sound is propagated in a free field when you have no reflection, no reflective surfaces around you. Like when you're, if you're uh, if you suspend a loudspeaker in a wire from a crane so it's far up above the ground and it's just emitting sound or it could be a, a, a really high chimney on a factory then that would be also like free field propagation because there's no reflective surfaces around that but as soon as you move inside a room you have the room boundaries the walls the floor and the ceiling which will reflect sound back at you so when you are inside a room the total sound pressure level equals the direct sound and the reflected sound together. And now, depending on how close or far away you are from the, s the source receiver distance, it's going to be one of these components that dominate the total sound pressure level. Now, for instance, if, uh, if you are, if I'm measuring the sound pressure level very close to my mouth, like this, it's going to be almost like 100% of the total sound pressure level that this uh, sonometer register will be direct sound. But if we put this one on a tripod 5 or 10 meters away from me in a, in a bigger room, then it's not going to be the direct sound that dominates. It's going to be the reflected sound instead. Because when the, when the sound is emitted from the sound source, you, you get like the, this laser beam that goes straight from the source to the receiver, but simultaneously you emit like millions of sound rays in all directions. And they, they are gonna hit different surfaces and bounce around and then they finally get to you. But the, the critical difference here is that a reflected sound has traveled farther, a, a, a lo longer transmission path, many more meters. And w the longer distance that the sound travels, the more of its energy it loses with the way. So it becomes more and more quiet the further away you are from the source. So if you if you take those in in the image here and you like straighten them out, you would see that it would be a quite a long transmission path compared to the direct sound, which will make it quieter. But on the other hand, if you take many 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 more of those and they add up, they can actually together surpass the direct sound and that they will do when the distance increases so if we measure inside a room how uh, sound is propagated like for instance you can you can see here right behind me i have this uh, omnidirectional loudspeaker here Th this is uh, the one that we we use when we do acoustic measurements and th this is a, a perfect point source is uh, as a loudspeaker is uh, as good as it gets basically as a point source now if i measure the sound pressure level at I I let's say we, we put this f one in a in a lecture room which is uh, quite large and then i would measure the sound pressure level at various distances from this from this speaker like 1 meter 2 meter, 3 meter, 4 meter, uh, like so I, go, I go a meter at a time and I measure inside a room uh, until I get to the end of the room. Then I would, I would get a sound pressure level variation inside the room and if we would plot it on, an, uh, on a graph it would look something like, like this. So you see here you have the distance on the on the x axis and then we go from like 1 meter, 2 meter, 4 meter, 8, 16 and so forth and so on. So when we're close to the source, you would have this that we talked about before, 6 dB attenuation 
every time we double the distance. This is exactly what happens here. And we, we if we measure with this uh, sound source, we would get this kind of graph. However, as the distance increases, depending on the room characteristics, of course, we're going to get more and more contribution from the reflected sound. And on a certain distance here, we will have an equal contribution from the direct sound and all those reflections. So that's what you can see here when th this straight line is extrapolated down. And then we have this reverberation field in the room. And when those two contributions are equal, you will, yeah, when they add up, you will get the total sound pressure level, which is the one that you measure with a, with a sonometer. And then there will be like a 3 dB increase just from those two components. And then if you move further and further away from the source into the room, then you will uh, enter the reverberant field of the room. And this is, this is a place where you will have precisely the same value on the sonometer. No matter where you put it, you're measuring inside the reverberant field. You're measuring the contribution of millions of, of uh, uh, randomly distributed uh, sound rays. And that means you will get the same result no matter where you put your microphone. However, if you measure the with, with an in the near field of, of, of the source, when you're really closer and closer to this one. Now, if, I'm, if I measure here compared to here, I will get a huge difference in, th in the measured sound pressure level. But if I go far away from the source, it's going to be the same. And when you do sound level measurements for sound insulation or installation noise and uh, stuff like that, uh, it's uh, usually a wise thing to make sure that you're measuring in the reverberant field. Th this is like a, a thing that I g get a little bit <laughs> frustrated when, when you see... Uh, let's say you want to buy a new refrigerator, perhaps, and then you have two models, where one that says this one has a sound pressure level of... Uh, 35 dB and the other one has a sound pressure level of uh, 40 dB okay then maybe the one that is 40 is worse but it all depends on yeah, wh what kind of distance are we talking here was, was the first one measured at 10 meter distance 35 dB and the other one was measured at uh, 1 meter distance to 40 then the second one would actually be <laughs> quieter so, so we always have to remember how was the measurement made because it it uh, has a huge effect on the complete result so here's the formula that we use we we have seen this one before where we have the sound power level 10 is for dec deci in decibels logarithmic transformation and then you have this q factor depending on if it was free field or towards a wall or a ceiling or a floor a number of surfaces in a corner you have spherical propagation, but then you have this term, which is new, which is 4 times 1 minus alpha average divided by alpha average times S, which is surface. I haven't talked about this term yet, but basically we could, we could, uh, we could say that this, this sec second part of the formula, this term deals with reflected sound, whereas this term deals with direct sound. And the alpha average thing here is uh, something that is um, can be calculated uh, from the room depending of on if it's uh, a lot of hard surfaces or if there are sound absorbing surfaces in a room. So if if it's like a concrete bunker or uh, an em empty bathroom, you will get a very low alpha. And or if if you go into a walk-in closet or a cinema, you would have a very high alpha, perhaps close to one. It's uh, like percentage. And the S is the total surface area of the room. But anyhow, the, the important takeaway here is that when you're close to the source, it's the direct sound that matters. And the reflected sound is important when you're far away from the source. The total sound pressure level in an enclosed space is determined by these factors. 
And usually the distance where the contribution from direct and reflected sound is equaled is what we call the reverberation radius. And when we do sound, me sound pressure level measurements, we usually want to be outside of the reverberation radius because then we're measuring in the reverberant field and we get the same result no matter where we, where we put our microphone. But if you're measuring within the reverberation radius, it's going to be hugely dependent on where you put your microphone. Now sometimes that can be uh, of interest, of course. If you, if you want to measure the sound pressure level from a machine in a workshop, maybe it's a wise thing to put the microphone where the human operator is positioned, even though he is in the direct sound of the source. But it all, it all depends on the purpose of the measurement. And usually we have ISO standards which specify precisely how each measurement should be done. What kind of distance should we have to sources and, uh, and stuff like that. How many positions, how many seconds do we need to measure in each position and so on and so forth. We take a look at this graph once again. Now it's in Swedish, unfortunately, but it's a, it says it's a sound pressure level on the y-axis. You have distance from source on the x-axis, source receiver distance. And then you have the first part, which is direct field or free field. And then you have Efteklangsfeld, which is uh, Swedish for reverberation field, a reverberant field. Now I have, I've done like several bends on, on this curve. And that is because the absorption of the room will affect the second part of the reflected. Uh, if you put absorbent material inside a room, it will have no effect on the direct sound because the direct sound does not bounce on anything. It goes the straight way from the source to the receiver. So if you have absorbers on all surfaces, like a padded cell, it doesn't matter. But for the reflected sound component, then the absorption is critical. If you, if you increase more and more sound absorbing material on all surfaces, you will have less reflected sound and then the, the s that second component will go down and down and down. And if you take it to the extreme that you have a huge amount of sound absorbing material in a room, you could almost kill the reflections altogether and then it's, you're basically back to uh, free field uh, propagation. And this is what happens in a, an echoic chamber in a sound laboratory. Where where you m you might have like one meter thick sound absorbers on every single surface inside the room, that is perfect free field propagation there. If you if you consider a a bathroom and a walk-in closet of equal equal room volume, then the bathroom would be higher up, where you have a l uh, oh wait did I. Oh crap, this uh, increasing absorption has, uh, it should be, uh, the graph has been a bit messed up in PowerPoint when I changed it. It's like when you, when you increase the absorption, it, it goes down, it shouldn't go up. That, w that was a bit silly. Let's see if I can fix that one. No, wait, oh, forget about it. We go back to this one. Maybe I can do like this. This is wrong. It shouldn't be like this. It should be hard room. It's really difficult to write with the mouse. But at least we get it correct. And here you would put like a soft room down here. That's the way it should be. I think I changed the, the, the font on the, on the slide or something. And, and, and then it moved around. I don't Sorry about that. So the walk-in closet, that's a soft room because you've got clothes everywhere. And then you have a lot of contribution from direct sound and almost nothing from the reverberant field. Whereas uh, an empty bathroom, it's hard surfaces everywhere, a little low absorption, and then, then uh, you get a lot of reflected sound. A church is also a good, perfect example of a room that is really hard, that have a lot of reverberant sound. And a cinema saloon would be uh, would be a really good example of a soft room because if you're in a cinema you want to hear the sound that is produced in the movie you don't want the room to color 
and affect the sound that is produced from the loudspeakers. You want to hear precisely what the sound engineer and the producer of the movie intended you to hear. So you are actually transported into this uh, scenery that you're looking at. So if you're looking, I I mean just imagine if, if, if a cinema would sound like a very reverberant l large bathroom. It would, it would not be a good experience to look at a, a movie in that way. But a church, on the other hand, would, would be really bad if, uh, if it were really high sound absorption in there. I mean, when you play the organ music and the choir music inside a church, it's very beautiful because you, you, the, the reverberance in the room fills out the, the, the musical notes and uh, they melt together with each other and create a really awesome experience. And the preacher is really good at adapting to this environment. Because if, if there's a lot of reflected sound, you cannot pre you cannot speech you cannot preach very fast like I do now. Because if you do like this and you have a lot of reverberation in the room, you, you it's just gonna blah, 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 blah. chaos. A preacher speaks slowly and precise, and that way he can utilize the room to his advantage instead. And if you take the conductor of a symphonic orchestra, they're like experts at this because they're touring with their orchestra in different different uh, concert halls uh, every night and no two concert halls sound the same they have different parameters but the conductor listens and okay this is a room that is a bit more reverberant then maybe we play a little bit slower in this passage or we we change so what when he's waving his stick he's actually <laughs> like a mixer board and, and and changing like a sound engineer what what the musicians are doing and they they are adapting it in real time to to the to the room which is uh, quite an achievement here's another example when when we have a if we take a thermometer and you measure how well yeah what's the temperature inside the room if you measure really really close to the radiator it's going to show that this is really warm inside this room. Whereas when you back away from the radiator, the temperature will go down. And I suspect that it will probably stabilize when you get to a certain distance from the, from the heat source. And you will get the same effect if you were to measure the sound pressure level inside this room that this vacuum cleaner creates. If you measure very close to the vacuum cleaner, you will get a really high sound pressure level because you're measuring direct sound and but as you m move away from the vacuum cleaner you got this 6 dB attenuation every time you double the distance until the reverberance reverberant sound of the room starts to add up and it even the total component of all these reflected rays surpass the direct sound then that's what you're measuring and then you will have the same sound pressure level no matter where you measure inside the room and that's equal equally to to temperature. But like uh, like we have this comment by Christoph in the chat that if you go into low frequencies, the lowest frequencies, they don't really behave like this. So those ones you have to be careful with. Th this is only valid for for the higher frequency spectrum. When we're dealing with low frequencies, we have to take special care because then then you can. Uh, even if you put the sound source in, in one corner of the room, you can measure really high sound pressure in the other end of the room. So, so that's when, when you have that kind of sound, like ventilation noise, when, when there's this rumbling m sound in the background from the ventilation, that's a typical low frequency sound that you have to measure in a special way. But if you're only dealing with ventilation that is coming from the duct, which is more like... That, that kind of uh, airflow sound that that one would not behave uh, because that's not a low frequency sound and then of course all sound absorbers aren't equal uh, either because you, you can have a sound absorber that is hugely efficient in uh, attenuating high frequency sounds but it has no effect on the lower frequencies and, and the inverse goes as well so uh, that that w that's why we usually look at this also in 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 different uh, frequency domains 
to, to find out not just one size fits all solution, but we, we always have to look at this when we're dealing with acoustics for separate frequencies. Just like when you're working with an image, you can't just focus on one color. You have to take all the colors into account. Now, how do we measure uh, sound insulation? Airborne sound insulation now is what we're dealing with here. So this is a basic setup to measure sound pressure level difference, which is called D, and D says for it's it's D as in difference. And you have that formula with uh, L D equals L S minus L M plus 10 logarithm T over T0. And then you have LS, that means level in the sending room, minus level in the M. Oh, it's Swedish, mottagare. It would be like R in English, receiving L in the receiving room. Could also be denoted as L1 and L2, perhaps, where L1 would be the sending or L and L2 would be the receiving. But anyway, you have uh, then you have the 10 logarithm t over t0. And this term is to like do a compensation for a furnished compared to an unfurnished room. When you're moving into or out of a, an apartment, you probably notice that when you take the furniture out of the room, it's going to be very, very reverberant in there. When you do like, it's going to be for a long time. But when you put your furniture inside and curtains and carpets and all that, it's going to be more like clap and it dies out quickly. This will, of course, have an effect on the measured sound pressure level because if you have an empty room, which we often do when we go to a construction site and measure in an early stage of the building, we need some way to compensate for that so that the, the values that we measure on the building site will still be relevant after the tenants have moved in and put their furniture there. So we do a little correction for that. And then we have the, a reference level of reverberation time, which is 0 0.5 seconds in a, in a normal dwelling. So that if you, like if you do a, a bang like this, or if you pull a gun uh, w w so to get an impulse sound, or you blow a balloon and you bam, and you, you bang it, then the sound typically stays for half a second. Well, if you do it in an emperor room, maybe it stays for two seconds. So, so that's why we have that correction. But we measure the sound pressure level in the reverberation field, not close to the loudspeaker, and then we go to the receiving room and we do the measurement again, with the speaker still in the sending room, of course, and we measure in the reverberation field, and that is because if we measure close to the separating wall here, this wall will act as a loudspeaker, and if we measure too close to the wall, you're going to get a higher value, which will be incorrect. So it's better to move away from the wall a sufficient distance and do your measurements out here in the reverberation field. And also here, you also need to measure in the reverberation field and not close to the loudspeaker. And it's the, it's the very same loudspeaker that you can see here. Oh, <laughs> that's a, there, behind me. That's the speaker we use. We put it in the room, we turn it on. I can, I can show you what it sounds like too. Let's see. So I have this, I have this little remote control that I can start and stop it. And uh, this is a very, very powerful loudspeaker. So it's, uh, it's like 120 decibels sound power level if I, if I give it the, the full beans. <laughs> now it's on the lowest possible level. So. We emit uh, pink noise from this one, all frequencies at once. And then I would measure inside this room what sound pressure level do I have in this room at various frequencies. Then I go into the next room and I measure again. And then when I have both the sound pressure level uh, in the sending and the receiving room, I also do a measurement of reverberation time, which I also use this speaker to do. And that's when you can like this, you turn on the noise and then you turn it off. I don't know if the microphone picks it up, but probably a little, like, I hope. And then from that you can, you can then, oh, that's, <laughs> I'm looking in the raw camera, that's the right one. <laughs> and then when you turn it on and turn it off, you, you can measure for how many seconds does the sound stay in the room. So in this case it would be, it's a really, really short reverberation time in here. 
and we do this in third octave bands. So we get several bands and, and we, we check them all. We, of course, we only do one measurement and, and then, then this uh, equipment can figure out and, and slice it up and check, check the different bands. So we do one measurement, but, but we're interested in, in to see what goes on in, in third octave bands. Then you have this other one, which is the sound reduction index, which is called R. It's basically the same measurement. It's very similar. R stands for reduction. The, the principal difference here is that you do, you do the correction in a slightly different way. You use AM, it's like a, a, the amount of absor absorption in, inside the room in, instead of the reverberation time. But yeah. One, one could say that uh, th this one could be expressed more like a measure of the specific building element, whereas the, the previous one, this one, D, per is perhaps more uh, correlated to what, it's, what it actually sounds like. And this is more like a measure of building elements. So uh, in Sweden now we use D when we measure in dwellings, but R is still with us in uh, in certain places with the uh, premises for instance and it, it, this also it varies varies a lot between different countries depending on what kind of building code they have so that's why you i, I mention them both because you will probably experience come across both of them if you're working in this field So here's a, a little recap about this. The weighted airborne sound insulation, then you have the W added to the, in the indices, or SNQs as I call them, single number quantities. We measure the airborne sound insulation, D and T and or R, in third octave bands between 100 and 3150 hertz. And then we weight them together to get this single number value, which we then can compare to the legal requirements. We couldn't do it with the, with the third octave values. It would be way too complicated. We need to get to derive a, a, a single number. So to provide a single number quantity, S and Q, the frequency bands are weighted together into D and T W, W for weighted, and then it, it's called the standardized sound pressure level disk difference or RW which is the weighted sound reduction index and another important thing to note here is that when we're working with airborne sound insulation at least in Europe we want to have as big of a distance difference as possible because if you have 100 decibels in the sending room and you got 50 decibels in the receiving room you got a difference of 50 and the larger that difference the quieter it will be inside your room but when we're dealing with a uh, walking sound which we'll deal with in a minute then it's the other way around then it should be as low as possible because then we're not talking about a difference we're talking about a level and a level sound pressure level should be as low as possible so what we do is that we, we measure these third octave bands and then our uh, sonometer, sonometer or equipment that we're using will produce a curve for different frequencies and what it looks like, which then are compared to a reference curve. And that's how we get this weighting to find out what, what does that, how can we go from these third octave values into a single number. So here's how the calculation is done. The blue line here is different reduction numbers and uh, this could be uh, perhaps uh, a wall between two rooms that have been measured. And then we have a blue dot for every third octave band, like so. And then we have a reference curve here, which is the re red one. And what we do is that we look at the unfavorable deviations below the reference curve and we add them up so that we get as close to 32 decibels as possible. So in this case you would have like 5, 6, 7 dB here in the 125 Hz band and you would have maybe 6 or 7 here again 
five, five, and maybe three there. And then when you add them up, like seven plus seven plus six plus seven plus three, and then um, it, it's basically you can use an algorithm that does this for you. But then when you get it as close to 32 as possible, uh, maybe we'll find out that this is only the addition results in uh, seven. It's a very small number. Okay, then we can move the curve upwards. So we shift the reference curve up or down in steps of one dB until the above condition is satisfied. That is how, how this uh, algorithm works when you calculate the uh, sound pressure level difference. So if you have a wall where there's a big gap, where it uh, like takes a crash dive here at 160 and up, then this reference curve would need to move down quite a lot. Whereas if you have a proper wall where everything is working, it typically follows this reference curve quite nicely. And then when you move this one until you get as close to 32 as possible, maximum, you should never go above 32, you go in and you read the value at 500 hertz and that gives you your RW. And the, the procedure to find out D and TW, the difference, it's precisely the same thing. So that's the airborne sound insulation for you. Now we move on and take a look at uh, impact sound insulation. And here you, yeah, you have the picture and yeah, yeah, I'll, like this machine I showed you before. I can take a look at it once again. Oh, wrong camera. Now we have it. Yeah. And then uh, this uh, this little fella, turn him on. And when I start hammering. Now this does not sound as walking traf walking sound. It does not sound as footsteps, not even close. It's a hammering sound. So uh which camera is acting? Yeah, that's <laughs> It does not sound as walking traffic. But what it does is that this one generates a, r a known force that excites the the floor in precisely the same way uh, for all constructions. We can put this uh, machine on uh, any floor and we know that we put in a certain amount of energy and then we go into the next room and we measure how much sound pressure level do we have in this room. And that, that's the basic principle of the impact sound insulation measurement and the impact tapping machine. This could also be compared to the to the loudspeaker, which uh, that one we, pr we we emit noise. We produce all frequencies at once, and that that's also kind of the point with the with the hammer machine. That when it's banging like this, we we it's it sends all frequencies at once into the floor. Whereas if you were to measure real walking sound with from footsteps, then you would only excite the floor with a sp specific frequency content which typically is if you're walking uh, without shoes it will be kind of low frequency content but if you just think of it if you if you put on a pair of shoes you will produce a different kind of sp of sound compared to when you're walking barefoot but we want to we want to have a measurement that can deal with all these things both high frequency, mid frequency, and low frequency sounds. Also, some important definitions here, which I've also encountered some common misconceptions, that impact sound is primarily walking sound from another room. Whereas when you have when you're walking inside a room, you can hear walking sound. That's denoted um Actually, I'm not 100% sure if this is correct English term, but it, we call it trumjud in Swedish, like drum sound, the sound of banging on a drum. That's the walking sound that we have in the same room, that one that you hear when you walk around on the floor. But it's the impact sound, that's the one that we are dealing with as uh, structural engineers. 
the the drum sound is not regulated in the same way it's basically it w it's something that we should take into account because it wouldn't be a nice thing to have if you have like a kindergarten or a school or something like that and w as soon as you walk on the floor it's like there's an elephant banging boom 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 like this on the floor it could it, it would be a really bad sound environment so that way you might have to stiffen up the construction to reduce the drum sound but the the impact sound the sound that is produced in another room that you hear in your room that's the one that we need to focus on so the purpose of impact sound insulation is firstly to handle walking sound but also to handle sound from scraping, toys and other structure borne sound. Another example of a room that would be really important to consider impact sound isolation, that would be a cafeteria or a dining room. I I've seen cases where we had a cafeteria with a hard floor surface and then there were offices below. And you get a lot of this screeching sound from chairs that are pulled back and forth and a lot of walking with shoes. And and uh, that's why we need to design something to handle this. And the impact sound insulation is uh, is how we deal with it. So we have some impact sound insulation S and Qs, single number quantities. And they are this first one, LNW, which is stands for weighted normalized impact sound level. And the normalization it's it deals with this uh, compensation with or without furniture in the room. And we also have the weighted standardized impact sound level. So these two are quite similar. It's a bit uh, the same thing as with the D and the R for airborne sign insulation. It's two different ways of dis deriving a single number quantity that describes the impact sound level. But we also have this spectrum adaptation terms that we use in, in Sweden and that other countries now are also adopting. And when we're looking at impact sound, we have a spectrum adaptation term that is called CI 50 to 2500 and the I stands for impact. So what this one does is that it increases the, the frequency range that we're looking at. So we go down all the way to 50 hertz to, to capture these walking sounds uh, that can be from the, uh, the running children, the booming sounds, the elephant upstairs. That's the purpose of the spectrum adaptation terms. So what it looks like in the Swedish, uh, in the Swedish requirements from the authorities in dwellings, you they, we have introduced uh, one that is called LNTW50, which is short. This is like a combination of the two, LNTW plus CI. 50 to 2500, but we write it as LNTW50. So that, that's the one you will see when you're out um, in, in projects in the future in, in Sweden with the requirement uh, reports and the regulations and stuff. And in premises, we don't go down to 50 hertz usually because that, that in the premises it's usually enough to go from 100 hertz. But in certain room types, there are requirements to go down to 50 as well in premises. In dwellings, it's always, but in premises, it's just sometimes. And the measurement of impact sound level, it works like this. We have a sending and a receiving room, and then we put the tapping machine on the floor, we turn it on, and we measure only in the receiving room. We, we're not interested in what goes on inside the sending room because here we're measuring a level, not a difference. And then we can calculate the normalized impact sound level in third octave bands like this. The N stands for normalized and uh, the I here is for the different third octave bands. You got I, uh, 50, 63, 80, 125 and so forth and so on. So I is the index for which third octave band are we dealing with. And then there is th this uh, correction term for with or without furniture, basically. And the measurements are made between 50 and 3150 hertz, usually. However, I would strongly recommend to measure from 20, because there's 
there's no harm in doing it. You just need to increase the span on your sound level meter to capture a bit more data. And even if you don't use it, at least you can, in the f in future, when uh, when new requirements are introduced, which they probably will be, you're going to be happy that you did those measurements five years ago and started to collect data. I've been measuring from 20 hertz since... Yeah, since uh, the better part of 10 years. So, uh, because we, we, we're going to need that reference data. It's, it's also like the, the research has indicated that we have strong uh, correlation with uh, the perception of sound. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wise thing to do to capture this data as well. There's no harm in having it and not using it. And then we have the other term here, L and T, the one that we use now in Sweden primarily. It's the same thing, but there's a, uh, there's a little bit different here how, how the um, compensation for the room takes place. And th this could also be measured uh, not just vertical, but also diagonal and uh, horizontal. It depends on what's the the most critical one to make sure that it works. If you do this in a concrete building, th this uh, I this little figure shows in a really good way what what's going to happen. You you s turn on the machine, and you're probably going to get the most sound directly below it. But the energy is also going to be transported in the building foundation like this and go into various other rooms. And you will not only have the direct transmission straight down, but it will also go out here into the adjacent walls and you get something that is called flanking transmission to, to the different rooms here. So you excite only one surface, but you will have sound radiation from several surfaces in, in the next room. And you've probably experience this too in a concrete building that when someone is using the impact uh, drilling machine like, like this you can hear it in the entire building perhaps even if they are measuring on the bottom floor and you live on the top story and you can still hear it like if it was your neighbor that is using that uh, hammering drill because once you get the energy into the building uh, foundation it propagates very effectively in, in concrete. I've actually did a measurement once where I tested precisely this. It was a long, long corridor with offices, several of them, I don't know, maybe 20 perhaps. And they were going to do some reconstruction work in the end of this hallway, which produced a lot of drilling sound. And we wanted to test do we need to evacuate this entire corridor or would it be possible to say that maybe the first 10 rooms need to be evacuated because they are too close to the source but we have attenuation with distance on the further part of the corridor just like when we looked at those room measurements you, you could see similar things if you measure inside a structure so I, I uh, had some um, construction workers then we teed them yeah just do some random drilling here and they were drilling and I started measuring office by office and what I found was this actually precisely the same figure I could see that when I was measuring close to the drilling place we got a huge, uh, high sound pressure level, and then the level started to decrease the further I got away from the construction place. But perhaps in the middle of the corridor, it stopped, and it leveled out, and then I got the same, same sound tr pressure level from this construction work, no matter how far I went away. And that's because we had like a concrete plate that that these rooms were standing on and we built up a reverberant field inside this concrete plate too we got like a direct field close to the excitation but then the sound rays propagate inside the structure 
and then when they hit the end of the plate, it bounces back inside the plate and creates a reverberant field. So we ended up, uh, we, I, th I think we, remember we had to uh, evacuate the whole corridor because it, it was too much sound everywhere because of this. The la damping is low and the sound is easily propagated. And the, yeah, there we have it again, the, the reverberation radius is when the contribution from direct sound and reverberant sound is the same. So, let's talk a little bit about the weighted impact sound level, LNW and LNTW, these two. They're given in, the two single number quantities is given in third octave bands from 100 hertz to 3150. And just as with the airborne sound station, this is basically the same slide, but I changed the, the names. To provide a single number quantity, an S and Q, the frequency bands are weighted together to L and W, normalized impact sound level, or L and T W, standardized impact sound level. And once again, we want to have as low values as possible when we're dealing with impact sound level. But with airborne sound insulation, we wanted to have as high levels as possible. And here's another little confusion, because if I recall co correctly, at in the Americas, they in the United States, for instance, I think they they flipped it ar around so so that the the term is defined in such a way that a, a higher value is actually better when dealing with impact sound, whereas in Europe a lower value is better. So uh, it could be worth mentioning if if there is some overseas audience looking at this lecture. And in the same way the as with the airborne sound, the impact sound level is now compared to a reference curve. So here we have a measurement of a, of a floor. And we got the blue dots, which define third octave band values of impact sound level. And we have the red one there, which is the reference curve. And then we focus on these unfavorable deviations from the reference curve. And in this case, a higher value is worse. So everything that is above the red line is an, unfa is an unfavorable deviation. And then we look at them, third octave band by third octave band, and add them up. So first we have 6 plus 8 plus 9 plus 6 again plus 3-ish. We add those up and see where do we end up in relation to 32. If it's above more than 32, then we need to shift the curve, the red curve, a bit up in steps of one. Or if it's uh, less than 32, then we can move it further down to increase that area of unfavorable deviations. That was a hard word to pronounce. But once we do this, move it, iterate it up, down, and then finally we, we find the right value where this is satisfied. And we read the curve at 500 hertz, and there we get the uh, value of the single number quantity. So that's how it's done. And usually when, when we have maybe a measurement that is not acceptable, then we can take a look at this blue area that is above the reference curve. Oh, yeah, that's where we need to take measures. If we want to improve the rating, we need to do something with the construction that improves the impact sound here in that area because if, if we improve it by 10 dB for all these bands what's gonna happen yeah the the red curve will go down quite a lot and we will achieve much better impact sound insulation and the same thing goes with the with the airborne sound but the but the other way around so we have these spectrum adaptation terms then C50 30 to 3150, that's for airborne sound, the first one. And then we have CI, I as in impact, 50 to 2500. And these are used because the normal SNQs consider frequencies 100 to 3150 hertz. But we know now that noise annoyance often correlates with low frequencies below 100 hertz. So we need to, some way to take that, that into account. So an increased frequency range g 
gives better correlation with perceived sound insulation. But here's then something that I learned, which you must know about the spectrum adaptation terms. So we first look at the impact sound. It's, it's not that obvious and it's not that pedagogical actually, because they're usually specified like this, that there, there is this term CI50, which you use a certain equation to determine what it is. And then you take the reference curve to calculate the L and TW, and then you take plus this one to find out what it is. But if we look closely at the definition, th this was like a big aha moment when, when I grasped it. You can see that in the definition of the spectrum adaptation term, you actually have this reference curve movement thing. And that's why you can... We take that one and we put it on the other side of the equation. So, so this is the expression we're interested in. And what remains then here is not a movement of the, of the reference curve. This is basically a simple logarithmic addition of third octave bands. That's what it's all about here. And that makes this a really simple operation to perform, if, you, if you're using a computer at least. Because then you, you just put up a little equation and you repeat it for all the bands. Add them up logarithmically and then you will get this value. It's, uh, it's, it's really, really simple when you look at it that way. And the, this part is just addish, logarithmic addition. But then we have this minus 15 thing, which I suspect is, has been added to make sure that the, the level that this results in becomes on the, s the same size as, as the other parameter so we don't have like L and T W which is 65 and then this one is uh, uh, 80 we, we remove them like 15 for all the bands to make sure that they end up somewhere in the vicinity of each other because that will simplify the way we the way we uh, define our requirements and they are defined at the moment in Swedish in Sweden so that you have to both satisfy this one, L and TW, it has a certain limit which you cannot go above. And to find that out, you have to do the reference curve shifting thing. But then you also have the requirement of these two together. So you have to do both the shifting and the third octave band addition. And neither of these two should go above a certain threshold level to have an acceptable uh, value. And then the same thing goes with the airborne sound, but it's a little bit different. Because here the spectrum adaptation term is defined a similar way. You have, you have the single number quantity here. And uh, that means we can m take this one and we put it on the other side. So we get the D and TW plus C50. This is what the Swedish requirements state for a dwelling. And then you have also here... Uh, logarithmic addition of third octave bands. However, here's the important difference, because the previous one, it was just just add added them straight away and, 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 and shifted them by 15. But with the airborne sound, we also do a frequency weighting here with this table, because different frequencies are perceived to be differently strong. And this is something that I talked about in the earlier, earlier lectures. And that's the Li here. We have the index. So we take each third octave measurement. We do the weighting correction here. And then we add, go to the next band. And then we take the next weighting. Take it to our measured value. And then we repeat this step 19 times to go all, three, all through these third octave bands. And then we add them up. So this is a weighted logarithmic addition of third octave bands. So it's actually it's quite a simple operation if you just keep focus and don't do any mistakes. A computer is really, really helpful in, in this operation. Now we move on to how is sound transmitted from one room to another. 
And then we have a good sketch here, a little figure, which shows four primary transmission paths. You have direct sound transmission, you have flanking transmission, you have something that we call cross transmission, and finally you have leakage. So in the, in the figure we can see here direct transmission, that's straight through the directly separating construction. It could also be on top of each other, vertical or uh, horizontal. When then you have flanking transmission, which is number two in this one. And the, uh, the obvious one would be here, like it goes down into the concrete plate, which starts vibrating from the sound in the sending room. Sound is transmitted into the next room where it also vibrates and then it emits sound in here. And the same thing goes for the walls. And what you'd really, really need to be careful with, especially if you're working with wooden buildings in the future, beware of continuous building elements between rooms, like the plate here. This is usually not acceptable. Because if they are continuous, you will get a huge contribution from flanking transmission. And you do not want that. And the same goes for walls. This is only okay to have continuous when the sound requirements are non-existent or, or low. You can probably do it in a conference room, but if you go up to the next level with a like CEO office or a psychologist or something like that, you always have to separate the plates, separate the elements between different rooms and, and separate the bottom plate. If you have uh, dwellings which are built like one, two, three, four, five apartments next to each other. Remember to separate the concrete plate between uh, each and every one of them. Otherwise you're gonna get huge problems. And you can get it here in the, in the ceiling. And uh, also with the attachment here, how the wall is attached to the ceiling. You can get some flanking transmission in the cavity above the suspended ceiling here, where it's like an installation cavity up here, where you can get some flanking transmission. Yeah, here too, the radiators. That's a classic. Especially in, in dwellings, I've seen this many, many times. That you have a radiator, which is like a big membrane, which is excited by sound and it starts vibrating. And then the vibrations are transmitted through the he heating pipes into the next room, where they start to vibrate the next radiator, which acts as a loudspeaker. And then you get the sound transmission through those. Maybe when you were kids, you tried this out when you take a little, ca a little uh, metal can and you put a, a wire, a string, and then you put, take another metal can, and then you made yourself a mechanical telephone and you stretch the wire and you can talk and you will hear on the other end what it sounds like. It's similar to this with the radiators. Three is cross transmission. Here you have an example that goes through the windows and into the next room. This is usually not a problem because you s rarely have both windows open at the same time. But what is a problem, however, is the ventilation system. When the, air, when the airborne sound goes into the duct, it's, it can't really go anywhere it, it, unless it comes out on the other side. And then it's radiated through f from the next uh, opening here where, where air is transmitted. So you need to put some kind of silencer between the rooms to get rid of this transmission path. This is similar if you've seen in old movies when they're on a ship when they're the captain is uh, full speed ahead to the engine room and maybe screaming in a pipe and they can communicate through that pipe is uh, really effective to to transmit sound. And then the fourth one here is uh, leakage, which basically le deals primarily with workmanship. If, if uh, mistakes are made or there are holes between the rooms, then you can have a really detrimental effect on the total sound insulation properties between these two rooms. It could be, for instance, uh, when, when they attach a wall to the next wall, uh, 
the the common outer wall in a building for example and you have an office here and you have the next office and then you have the separating wall then if you take a piece of paper and sometimes if, if they did a bad job you can take the paper and you pull it and it comes out on the other side <laughs> it it kind of looks like it's tight but in in acoustic terms this is a uh, completely open so we need to get them airtight if you fill the wa room with water, the water should not come out. And if it does, then you have a leakage somewhere. And those are very important with regards to sound in insulation. Another form of, of leakage could be in a door that is not properly adjusted. Because just... Uh, I, I remember some years ago, I... Uh, I had some door measurements that I was making and it, they, they are very similar to the ones with this when you measure room to room but when you have an outer door like this then you have this uh, this part of the door and sometimes you can just take a screwdriver and bend some things here to make sure that when you close the door that it really really is a snug fit and just by doing that I think I got like 7 dB improvement in sound insulation and you also need to take a look. Yeah, this is actually a good good door to do the example uh, demonstration on because you can see, hopefully, down here. If I go really low, oh, how low can I go? Yeah, there we have it. You can see light coming in from outside. This is leakage, not only for sound but for heat as well. But well, if you if you can see daylight on the other side of the door you you've got a problem you got a problem with sound so always make sure that it's airtight very very important so let's check these terms uh, this uh, transmission paths now uh, one by one so the direct sound transmission i would define that as sound that is transmitted directly through the separating construction and usually this is the primary one that we need to focus on because it's the largest partition in the room that radiates sound and if the direct sound transmission is bad then um, it doesn't really matter what goes on in the other uh, transmission paths if, if this one is uh, completely inadequate but what we usually see is that sometimes you, ca you can have a proper, really thick, really good uh, sound insulation in a wall between two rooms. And when that transmission path is uh, taken care of, then usually it's the flanking transmission, which is our next focus. And then I I if we... If we have problems with flanking transmission, we can improve and improve and improve the separating wall between these two rooms. And it won't matter because the sound is coming another path. Then we have flanking transmission. And I would define that as sound that is transmitted between two rooms as structure borne sound, another path than through the directly separating construction. And like the examples I mentioned here, radiator pipes, ceiling, floor, or flanking walls. And when we have high sound requirements, as we do with dwellings, we need to be very careful with the flanking transmission. So we don't have these common, continuous building elements between different rooms, because they are very effective in transmitting tr sound between them. And like I said, the flanking transmission determines the total sound insulation when the directly separating construction has high sound insulation. So we, we need to put our money where we get the best possible result from it. And that's why it doesn't matter if we put the world's best wall <laughs> if we have lousy flanking connections. They need to be about on the same level, all of them. 
same ambition level on every path. That would be a good thing. Here are some examples on how what is good and what is not good with flanking transmission. We have to the to the left side we have the best solution and to the right side we have the worst solution here. So if we, if we start from the best side we have the it's like an outer wall here in the building and then we have the directly separating wall. So we want to make sure that we have good sound insulation between these two rooms in a horizontal direction. Now if the if we can let this wall continue all the way through out here, this would be the best possible because we, we really cut the flanking transmission with this one really effectively. But this on the other hand is not that good if we're dealing with if this really is the outside, if this is the outdoors, you're gonna get some heat problems with heat leakage instead. So that's why we want to put this one as far to the inside as possible, because then we get good thermal insulation o on this construction. But then if we take it inside, we go to the worst part here. Now we have this continuous element that I was talking about. When someone is speaking here, this plate will start to vibrate and the vibrations will be transmitted very effectively through this common pl plate in here where it keeps vibrating and emits sound. And we, we even get through the cavity also and from the second plate as well. So this is how you should not do it with regards to flanking transmission. But like I mentioned here with the thermal insulation, I mean there there's always different domains that we need to take into account and to find a compromise because th this is also the thing that was really clear to someone like me because I, I started engineering physics back in university and uh, had a s very strong focus on acoustics so I, I got a lot of in-depth knowledge in my specific domain but when you go out into the real world you will never ever design a building that only takes your domain into account because then you have to learn to adapt to, to all the other uh, domains like ventilation, fire, structural engineering, water piping, landscape, architecture. I mean there's all these uh, disciplines that have their say and we have to together find the best possible compromise with regards to sustainability, economical, social and economical. So we move on. Here's a common solution with uh, wooden buildings when we're dealing with flanking transmission. Just gonna check here if I've got some uh, no, actually, I think I've lost them. Uh, I was going to show you one of these little vibration insulation. It's it's like a small rubberish, rubbery material that is uh, flexible. And when you have different stories in a building, you put these silomer strap uh, strips or or small pieces at different places in the building between each story, because with these you can reduce the uh, the flanking transmission because you want to you want to construct the building so that the the floor and the ceiling below should not have a structural connection if we're talking a multi-family dwelling here it's okay to do it if it's within your own family because then you can communicate if people are banging too hard on the floor but if it's your neighbor in a different dwelling they should not be connected and that means that they either you 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 have them completely separated and you carry the load in in the walls on in, in sides but then that's the reason why you put this vibration and uh, insulation things around the edges to eliminate the no not eliminate to reduce the the flanking transmission but another way of doing it could be to suspend the ceiling so that you you have the, the, the floor slab 
and then you suspend the ceiling with something that is like a little hook and a second hook and a soft material in between. Or it could be a metal profile that, that is flexible, that carries the roof. The, not the, the ceiling, sorry. And also when you, when you work with these, if you consider a one-room student apartment, for instance, it's not equally heavy all around the apartment. Because in one, the major part of the apartment would be a dwelling room, a living room. I mean, and the other one would perhaps be the kitchen and the toilet, which are heavy. So you get a, it's heavy on one side and it's lighter on the other side. So that's why you have to adapt the stiffness of these elastic interlayers all around the building for different types of rooms as well. Here's another little thing that is good to know because we come across when we're looking at um, product description or technical specifications for different uh, products. You, some, you, you have either laboratory or field measurement values. So when you have a field measurement, usually the single number quantity will have a little prime sign. Uh, for example, here you have R prime W, D prime N T W, L prime, and so forth and so on. What this means is that these measurements is from a representative building in the field, in situ measurements. Whereas you have, when you're looking at a laboratory value, it's usually the single number quantity without the prime sign, which means you don't have the flanking transmission. You're only measuring the directly separating construction. Because a laboratory, it basically looks like this. You have a concrete bunker with insanely good sound insulation all around. And then you have a common wall in between, which is really, really thick concrete. And then there's an opening between these two rooms. And in this opening, you construct a wall partition that you want to test. And then you do a, a, a regular sound insulation measurement. And it works the same way if you do laboratory measurements on uh, impact sound also. It's like a concrete bunker with an opening in the, in the ceiling. And then you put in the, 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 the floor slab that you want to test the construction. And the, and, and the rest of the structure is so strong that there, there is no flanking transmission. And then you can isolate and really look at what, what's going on with this building element in particular. But the important thing to know here is that if you look at the laboratory value and it says, yeah, this wall has uh, 60 dB, you will not get 60 in the finished building. Because in the finished building, you will also have the flanking transmission. You will also have cross transmission through the ventilation and all these transmission paths that we mentioned. And also you, you have some workmanship issues as well. So it's always going to be a lower value in the finished building. So we need to have some safety margins when we design them. And the total sound insulation. It's like the saying, a chain is never stronger than its weakest link. So if you want to have a huge improvement in sound insulation, you have to identify which is the weakest link in this. Of, of all these paths, which one produces the most sound in your neighbor's room? And you fix that one. That's what you should do. If you're on the ocean in a boat that is sinking and you have several holes in the hull, I prefer to fix the largest hole first then we can take care of the little ones which is just like like this but if you have a huge hole that is just pouring water inside your ship that's where you need to focus your attention so we move on to the third one crosstalk or cross transmission which is direct sound transmission by airborne sound i i uh, I usually specify flanking transmission. I prefer to say that that's like structure-borne sound through through a building element. But with the crosstalk, it's like with the ventilation pipes uh, or, or channels or duct, duct maybe is the correct word. 
you have airborne si sound that goes into these and comes out in into the other room. And it could also be through the cavity above the, the ceiling and, and, and ventilation ducts. So it's it's basically it's it's not an it's not an error, it's something that is inherent in the building structure that, that we we just have to take care of it so we don't end up with this situation. Because uh, here you have ventilation ducts between these two rooms when they have a meeting and they want to have secrecy. And this one is maybe reading, so he, he wants to, he don't want to be annoyed. So here you have annoyance and secrecy, you have both at once. This one, this guy suffers from annoyance and, and these guys, they suffer from secrecy issues. Because you have the ventilation duct like this and there is no sound silencer here. What they should do is to put a silencer as close to the wall as, pro as possible on either side here. You don't want to put it a bit into the room because then you can have like breakout transmission. If, if the duct is exposed for like two meters and then you put the sound silencer, it will not be as effective as if you put it closer to the, to the separating wall. Here's another example of two different ways of solving this. Because usually we have supply and return air, two ducts that goes next to each other. And this layout A is easy to do. You, you just take holes and you go through every single of these rooms and then you have the supply and the return air. But what happens here is this is very prone to cross transmission. A better way of solving this is to do it in the corridor instead and then you make small uh, uh, one separate supply and air supply and return air for each room because then you can also put a uh, silencer in between each of these which would be a cheaper way of doing it and and mu much better much better way to avoid this uh, cross transmission. The problem with cross transmission is if you have that problem, it can be really easy to have a conversation between these two rooms. You can hear exactly what is said in the next room, which can be a huge problem. And then finally we have leakage, which is catastrophic for sound insulation. And that's, it's when the construction is an airtight, like the one I showed you here in my, my own little door here. This is from a, a school I measured some years ago where they had problem with problems between two lecture rooms. I mean, you, you could argue that perhaps it's good value for money. You go to one lecture, but you get two for the price of one because you could hear the other one perfectly in the next room. But uh, on second thought, it would be better to just do away with these uh, holes. It used to be a door here once upon in, in time. And then they uh, didn't seal it properly. They they put a bookshelf in front of it instead, <laughs> so you couldn't see the hole. But it was it was a it was a really large hole in here. I think may, maybe th about about this size, perhaps you could see it straight into the other room. So it was very obvious. This one is very very common. I've done hundreds of sound me measurements in uh, in my career. And uh, we go out to the building site and we want to write the report and s so they can show that, yep, this uh, fulfills all the required, r r all the requirements. But I've lost count on how many times I had to give a fail on, on the report because of stuff like this. You have wall pass-throughs and then there's just an opening and it hasn't been sealed. And then you, you, you can't fulfill the, the sound requirements if there are openings. It's very, very sensitive. So this, this one also, it just, it just costs a lot of money if, if we don't take care of these things straight away. And here's to illustrate the importance of leakage. So here we have an example where we have dwellings. where well, the requirement is... Uh, the single number quantity with the spectrum meditation term 57 dB is the target. The wall has a 60 dB sound insulation 
and then it turns out there's going to be a little gap in between here. How large can this gap be and still fulfill the total sound requirement? Well, we do some calculations and we're going to find out that it can only be 0 0.0025 millimeters. I don't know if that's like uh, the thickness of a human hair or, or something like that. Then you, if it's larger than that, you lose more than 3 dB and you will have failure. So th this is like the, the example I measured. If you take a, a paper, a normal piece of paper, and if you can put it through, that's not good. And an, uh, also a, a quick check is, is a light source. If you can see light coming out on the other side, you have a problem. And this is uh, the final slide. We we're going to check uh, round up with the leakage. Here, here's a really interesting experiment, probably from some laboratory measurement, where they have a, a wall, 75 millimeter thickness, maybe it's some kind of concrete wall, and they measure the airborne sound insulation here. And then they have four different types of holes in it. With 0, 1, 3 and 7 millimeter diameter on these holes. So at first, when there is no hole, you get 45 dB sound reduction on this wall. But then you take your drill and you, mm, you do a 1 millimeter hole in it. You can see there's a huge drop in sound insulation. It goes from 45 to 37. You lose a lot. And you see here, B, here's what, it, what happens. You get a big dip at the high frequencies, that's where you lose it. At the lower frequencies, the effect is not that hard. It's almost the same, but up here it's catastrophic. And then when the hole increases, you get another huge hit. Another 7 dB is shaved off with a 3 millimeter hole. And now you've got like a parallel shift of the curve down here. Because now, now the lower frequencies also start to come through the hole uh, because the diameter increases. Because you remember from the first lecture where we talked about the size of sound. Higher frequencies, shorter wavelength. Low frequency, longer wavelength. So in the first case with a really small hole, the low frequencies with their long wavelengths, they don't fit. They can't come through on the other side. It's too small. But the high frequencies... They are small in size, so they can make it through on the other side. But the larger the hole gets, the more of the low frequency content can come through as well. And you see here in the, with a 7 millimeter, uh, it's still uh, 7 millimeter isn't that large of a hole. But the sound insulation is completely destroyed from 45 to 23. I mean, there is nothing left if, if you have such a large hole. Which kind of reminds me, I mean, 7 millimeter, if, if we just look at this, this picture. Uh, this is definitely larger than, than 7 millimeters. So remember the importance of leakage. And uh, that was the final one. I hope you learned something really useful from this. And uh, I'll uh, see you guys uh, later then with the fourth and uh, final lecture uh, this Friday. So, see ya.